gas chamber choke, gasp and wheeze. Unfortunately, these are words that we've become accustomed to hearing each and every year. That's because the national capital faces emergency-like situations due to pollution each and every year. Now, while the average particulate pollution levels in Delhi are lesser than at least three other Indian cities, every winter, Delhi's pollution levels cross the severely toxic mark. Behind me is a map that actually depicts pollution levels across the world. This is brought to you by Air Visual. It's a really cool site that actually maps in real time pollution levels around the world. Now, this is going to be playing out throughout this conversation. As of 4 p.m. though, Indian Standard Time, Delhi's Air Quality Index, or AQI, soared to 468. Why is that such a big number? Think of AQI as a yardstick from 0 to 500. Right? The more you move away from the lower levels, the more polluted and toxic the air is for you to breathe. If 0 to 50 is considered a measure of clean air, Delhi's air quality is more than 10 times worse than normal. So what are the major pollutants? According to a CSE report, road dust and vehicles constitute roughly 60% of all pollution. Domestic sources and industries contribute to 25% of pollution. Crop burning or stubble burning in neighboring states is often blamed for the problem. Now, here's a map which tells you how pollution due to crop burning is rampant, right? That said, how do other major cities around the world fare in comparison to New Delhi? The chart shows that London's air is purer than Delhi's by a whopping 10 times or a thousand percent. Well, we're hardly the first country to face such a pollution problem, right? Every economy in its developing phase has to counter pollution in some way. Are there lessons that we can learn from other cities? How is pollution kept in check in these mega cities? How can we prevent such extreme hazardous levels of pollution? To discuss all that and more, we have with us Hal Harvey, CEO at Energy Innovation, a San Francisco-based energy and environmental policy firm. Hal, thanks so much for speaking with us at Bloomberg Quinn. I want to start by asking you, well, if you look at what's happening in Delhi, Delhi's air quality has remained severe for four consecutive days now, and this seems to happen each and every year in the winter months in India. But this is something that mega cities like Beijing have been dealing with for years. So how do you think a city like Delhi should approach such a massive problem? It's clear that Delhi has terrific opportunities to drastically cut air pollution, but it requires a long-term strategy. <clears throat> if you try to do this with emergency measures, you will fail. What has to happen first is a comprehensive inventory of all sources, be they agricultural or industrial or transportation. And then for each of those, <clears throat> jump ahead to the best possible solutions. I would say that Delhi has a huge advantage compared to, say, New York City or London or Los Angeles, because the technologies for ultra clean manufacturing and especially ultra clean transportation are available for all right now at roughly the same cost as a dirty manufacturing or dirty transportation system. So there's this concept called leapfrog development. Indians now have cell phones. They didn't have to, not everybody had to buy a landline first and then transfer to a crappy cell phone and then to a good cell phone. They went directly to the great cell phones. And there's absolutely no reason why the same can't be done with pollution control equipment. You know, Al, it's interesting you talk about pollution control equipments and leapfrogging because, uh, well, if you actually consider what happens with pollution control e equipments, the administration in Delhi seems to be blaming uh, crop residue burning in neighboring states, uh, Punjab and Haryana for Delhi's pollution woes. But the argument that's really made against pollution control equipments is the fact that they are exorbitantly priced and perhaps not affordable for farmers. So what I want to understand from you is, is that a legit argument that's actually made against um, well, pollution control equipments and, and emerging technologies? So uh, different sources create different types of air pollutants. The most insidious and dangerous for human health are the very small particle matter, so-called PM 2.5. And those typically come from high temperature industrial processes, and especially from car and truck and motorcycle and tuk-tuk engines. So the first step is to require every car sold in India and every truck sold in India and every motorcycle to have very, very tough real world air pollution tailpipe standards and to be fueled with clean fuel. The human lives saved from this drastically outweigh the costs of this. 
Uh, and to slow walk that process is to condemn literally millions of people to early deaths. So that has to happen very quickly. The second thing is to do the same with the large industrial producers, to go to the cement factories, pulp and paper, steel, chemicals. Every one of them needs to have an inventory system and a control paradigm. And again, this is a matter of, it's a national emergency and it's a matter of public health. There will always be protests against every single step, that it's too expensive and so forth. But you cannot build a modern economy in a foul air environment. It simply can't be done because anyone with mobility or talent will leave and those that remain will suffer. You asked about the agricultural side and I know that's important too. I come from a, a ranching and farming family myself. And the answer is to use methods of tilling the old crop into the ground or planting proper cover crops rather than burning everything. Ag burning creates a different kind of, of pollution. It's very visible, it's very, it's unpleasant, but it's not as bad for the lungs as the tiny particle. It's interesting, Hal, you mentioned that because when you're talking about building big economies, well, China has tried to combat pollution in a number of ways, be it declaring air pollution a disaster or using methods like cloud seeding uh, when it comes to smog and managing traffic flow more efficiently. Delhi hasn't been as innovative, and once again, what they're doing is implementing the odd even scheme, where private cars with odd and even license plates will only be allowed on roads on alternate days starting from next week. What kind of out of the box solutions have worked for other cities in the past? So, a number of uh, cities have tried odd even strategies, and they work, uh, they make a modest effect for a short term. Over time, people find their way around them. They, they buy two sets of license plates or they buy a second car to use on the, on the day when their primary car doesn't work and, and so forth. But the, the bigger idea is actually an excellent idea, which I call car control. If you put too many cars in a city, you ruin the city. You ruin it with air pollution, but you also ruin it with congestion and with noise. So the major world-class cities around the world are instituting car control in different ways. In Beijing, they limit the number of cars by lottery that can be registered each year. In Shanghai, you have to buy a permit, which now costs about $13,000 in order to get a car. In Tokyo, you have to prove you have a parking place before you're allowed to buy a car. In Copenhagen, when the parking is full, they turn all the traffic lights on the roads coming into the city red for a minute and 45 seconds, then green for only 15 seconds, and so forth. So the great cities in the world are the cities where you don't need a car. And the best kind of prosperity is the kind of prosperity that doesn't anchor you to pollution and congestion. And that's where not just India, but all great countries and all great cities need to move. Right, Hal, but you know, that's from, uh, of course, from uh, the policy standpoint. I want to understand something from the legislation standpoint as well. After the great smog of 1952 in London, we saw the enactment of uh, the Clean Air Act. The U.S. has its own Clean Air Act. I, I want to understand, is legislation or regulation the best way to deal with air pollution in a northern India as well? So legislation and regulation are both required. One has to give the air pollution control authorities power that's equal to the supply side, to the manufacturers, to the ministries of industry, and so forth. In most countries, the Environmental Protection Agency or the Ministry of Environmental Protection is kind of a weak sister compared to the other agencies, and that simply doesn't work. I think a, a, the precept to a strong economy is a clean environment. These things are inseparable, and, it's, and it should not be considered a hindrance to an economic development, but an accelerant. L let me give one example because it's quite interesting. In the United States, there was a, there's a famous engine company called Cummins Engine. I think they actually sell in India as well. And they were caught many years ago cheating on their air pollution standards. They had kind of an epiphany after they were caught. They realized that they had better technology than any other engine manufacturer. And therefore, the tighter the standard, the bigger their advantage. So they flipped the idea completely. And this had a very powerful effect now where they're building, I think, the best diesel engines in the world. And they're getting rewarded for it. And this is the kind of flip we need in Delhi and in other Indian cities. I'll just give one more example. 
part of the issue is to build a world-class public transportation system, including safe, convenient biking and walking. And now electric bikes are just booming across the world. You want to make the non-automobile way to get around, the first class way to get around, the best way to get around. It is in Paris, it is in London, it is in New York, it is in San Francisco. It should be that way in Indian cities as well. The, the, the transportation problem in India cannot be solved with more private cars, and it will surely exa exacerbate the air pollution problem. No, absolutely, Hal, that's an interesting point that you bring up. And, and since you've brought up electric, now the interesting thing is that the Indian government is actually making a very strong electric vehicles push and actually aims to electrify all new vehicles by 2030. Now we're hoping that would abate pollution uh, to some extent as well. What I want to understand from you is, can emerging technologies like electric go a long way in solving our pollution problem? So a absolutely. First of all, there, there will be a lot of internal combustion engines built in the world. They should immediately jump to world-class standards. And there needs to be real world enforcement and testing. This is as elementary as protecting your own child from poisoned food. You're protecting your own child from poisoned air. There should be absolutely no excuses to shortcutting to the end. But then in terms of new technologies, electric transportation is booming. One needn't think about just electric cars. I sometimes say an electric traffic jam is still a traffic jam. But think about electric bicycles for a city like Delhi or any Indian city. You can get to work without being too sweaty from exertion. You can cover a longer distance. You can move rapidly around even if you're not in perfect shape. And yet you take the same space as a bicycle and you're just as quiet as a bicycle and you have no local air pollution. And when you need to charge your battery, you simply snap it off the bike and bring it inside. There have been 200 million electric bicycles sold in China already. I think that's just a fantastic solution. And as soon as you put more people on these bicycles, there's a political reaction. They're gonna demand safe, segregated bike paths. So you can imagine streets that are quiet, clean, uncongested, and fast, and yet offer low cost mobility for everyone. It, it's, not, it's not magic. It's a matter of rethinking what we have and then taking advantage of some of the new technology. All right, Al, thanks so much for joining us on Bloomberg Win from New York. We really appreciate you taking out time for us. Now, for all those wondering and who really missed the start, well, the map behind me depicts air pollution around the world. It's brought to you by a company called, uh, by a website called Air Visuals. And this is real time. And it's kind of shocking if you see this, guys, because we've zoomed in to the section which includes, well, to, well, South Asia, per se. And if you look at all the red parts, the red and purplish, maroonish parts, especially the dots near New Delhi, they have crossed all permissible levels. 300 plus is what they are on the map. And that's where you're seeing what's happening in capital city right now. It's also similar in parts of a northern China and central China. Um, but there are cities like Beijing, which have managed to get uh, that number down drastically. A lot of the industrial zones are actually reflecting that. But, you know, this is essentially how alarming the whole situation is. You actually go down in around Thailand and it's, it's completely green. So, well, for, for all that really, you know, that conversation was to not give you a weather check. It was more to tell you how shocking the situation is and what kind of solutions we can actually adopt to make everything around us, uh, well, a much better place. Thanks so much for tuning in to Bloomberg Quint.